all, I'd like to thank Aubrey and the SENS Foundation for inviting me to um, come here today and tell you a little bit about what we're doing in our laboratory in North Dakota. <coughs> we're about an hour from the Canadian border, for those of, you, those of you that don't know. And what I want to talk to you about today is the Ames dwarf mouse, which is the small mouse on the right-hand side of this upper picture. These animals live 50 to 70% longer than wild-type animals. And I'll go into a further description about their genotype and phenotype um, a little bit further into the, into the talk. So the first thing I want to um, take care of is the acknowledgments. Just to thank uh, Charlene Mercosi, which is the technician in the lab that does a phenomenal job and is a wizard at enzyme assays. And to also thank Eric Uthis, who's my collaborator at the USDA Human on, uh, Nutrition Research Center that's on campus. And then to thank the National Institutes on Aging, uh, the University, and the Glenn Foundation in particular for funding um, a lot of this work. So what I want to cover today is to go over what our primary interest in the lab is, and that's the relationship between stress, stress resistance and longevity. We use the Ames dwarf mouse primarily, but we've also used some other long-living mutants um, to look at these um, various pathways. We think that glutathione and methionine are the key players involved with this ability to couple stress resistance with longevity. And we also have evidence that growth hormone is involved now. We think it plays a coordinating role in regulating stress resistance. And then if there's time left, and she'll tell me, I'll tell you there's a little bit of supporting evidence that it's not only these systems that are altered in this animal, but there's other defense mechanisms that are also upregulated. So this is just a table that shows the phenotypic characteristics of long-living mice, and these are growth hormone mutants. So each of these mouse models has a suppressed um, growth hormone IGF-1 signaling pathway. The Ames and the Snell have um, a, uh, a point mutation in genes that allow uh, differentiation of pituitary glands. So they don't develop the somatotropes or the cells that produce growth hormone, so they have low levels of growth hormone. The growth hormone receptor binding, uh, growth hormone receptor binding protein knockout animals have a mutated growth hormone receptor, so they have high levels of growth hormone, but uh, no IGF-1 signaling from the liver because of the mutated receptor. And then there's the IGF-1 receptor heterozygote and the clotho mouse. So these are a couple of examples of growth hormone mutants that have, again, altered growth hormone and IGF-1 signaling, and they all live longer than their wild-type counterparts. And what we're primarily interested in is the, that all of these animals exhibit some form of stress resistance, primarily oxidative stress resistance, because that's been kind of the trend in aging in the aging field that people focus on oxidative stress. But they also so, show some resistance to other types of stressors. So this is different types are different mechanisms of cellular stress resistance or cellular defense. Um, many of these mechanisms are very tissue specific. Um, they include the scavenging systems, um, such as antioxidant defense um, enzymes, catalase, SOD, glutathione peroxidase, the detoxification enzymes, which are glutathione S transferases, which are located primarily in the kidney and the liver, um, heat shock proteins, uh, repair systems, metal chelators, apoptosis, these can all be considered cellular defense mechanisms or cellular um, stress resistance type mechanisms, and then you can but yours that I haven't mentioned right here. So our pet mechanism currently is um, the glutathione and methionine metabolic pathways. Glutathione is a well-known antioxidant, but it also has several other functions within the system. It's involved in DNA synthesis and repair, um, protein synthesis. Um, it's obviously involved in the metabolism of toxins through the GSTs, amino acid transport, and several other things. And the methionine pathway um, lies just upstream of the glutathione pathway <coughs> in that this, this is an essential amino acid that provides the cysteine residues for glutathione synthesis. And methionine um, metabolism is involved in protein synthesis and also in phospholipid biosynthesis. One of the components of methionine is S-adenosyl methionine. And this is a, um, provides, is, that SAM, or S-adenosyl methionine, um, provides or is the primary source of methyl donation for DNA methylation um, reactions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then we also know that um, both vitamin B12 and folate are involved in the synthesis of methionine, and that dysfunction of these uh, vitamins and um, 
those types of things also um, dysfunction causes them, various uh, various diseases. So methionine is an extremely important amino acid. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about our, this is our poster child for aging, that's what we call it, the Ames dwarf. This animal um, exhibits hereditary dwarfism, and it wasn't until like 30, about 35 years late, later when they discovered that it was a, a point mutation in a gene that drives differentiation of the pituitary gland. So this point mutation results in a lack of development of the somatotropes, the um, lactotropes, and the thyrotropes in the pituitary gland. So these animals are growth hormone, prolactin, and thyrotropin thyro deficient. Um, we showed several years ago that these animals live, the males live 50% longer and the females live 68% longer than wild type animals, which is very significant. Um, I can tell you a couple other things. They have very, very low incidence of cancer. So their tumor burden is much lower. Their incidence of different types of cancer is altered in comparison to wild type animals. They are extremely insulin sensitive. Um, their core body temperature, because of the lack of thyrotropin, they have very low levels of thyroxin, so their core body temperature is about, is about a degree and a half lower. And their antioxidant defense systems are significantly enhanced. And that's shown here. So this is the summary of the, the work that we've done over the past several years. We've been able to show that the hydrogen peroxide production um, by the mitochondria is significantly reduced in these animals. The enzymatic antioxidants that I mentioned before, catalase, SOD, GPX, the, pro the activities of these enzymes, the protein levels and message expression is upregulated in these animals. If we add that growth hormone, you downregulate the expression of these enzymes and their activities. And we've done that in vivo. And we've also taken normal wild type cells to add a growth hormone and you downregulate the expression. <clears throat> so we also know that non-enzymatic antioxidants, um, I mentioned GSH, um, metalthionine is also a powerful antioxidant. These bile-containing um, bile proteins are all significantly upregulated in these animals. And the most important thing is that they're functionally significant. So if you, if you um, inject these animals with paraquat, which produces a systemic oxidative stress, the dwarf animals out-survive the wild-type animals. So this upregulation is significant functionally. Um, we've also looked at protein damage, DNA, oxidative DNA damage. Barhaus group looked at mitochondrial DNA damage and inorganic peroxides, and they're all significantly lower in these animals, which also suggests that these, this in enhancement in antioxidant defense is functional. And then we've also spent a lot of time looking at oxidative phosphorylation and very, uh, enzymes and various um, enzymes within the mitochondria. And most of these are highly upregulated in these animals. In addition, CoQ9 and CoQ10 are also increased in the Ames mouse over wild type animals. So it suggests that their ability to fight oxidative stress is um, enhanced you know, in, on many fronts. So this just represents the GSH data that we found. Um, this is the reduced form of glutathione is GSH, and it's enhanced at 3, 12, and 24 months. And this, again, this is in liver tissue. And we also found that the oxidized form um, of GSH, glutathione disulfide, is also enhanced or also increased in these animals. And so the total pool of glutathione available is much higher in the Ames dwarf compared to wild type. So this is a, one of those hairy biochemistry metabolic pathway things that you don't want to see. But what we'll do is focus, break it down a little bit and focus um, on glutathione initially. So this, our initial finding was that glutathione was increased in these dwarf animals. And so we started to look at some of the enzymes involved in its metabolic pathway. So um, it begins as cysteine, and it's acted upon by glutamyl cysteine ligase. This is the rate-limiting um, enzyme in the biosynthesis of glutathione. So we've looked at the expression of this enzyme. We've looked at the utilization of glutathione in reactions by looking at GPX and glutathione as transferase, and looked at recycling of the disulfide or oxidized form back to the reduced form by looking at GR or glutathione reductase. In addition, glutathione is, is broken down primarily by an enzyme called gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, or GGT. This is found primarily in the kidney, um, and I'll show you what we found with regard to this particular enzyme in these animals. So again, we're just going to focus on the lower half right now, maybe. 
So this is just representative again of liver and kidney primarily. 